So what we're going to cover today is on the is on the uh, wall. If you can't, um, I'm assuming you can all read it, so I'm not going to do you the favor of assisting in that way. But um, to design, we're going to start with the designing interpretation panels. Now, the primary way in which an exhibition or a museum is set up is is around a set of objects or a set of images or paintings or something like that. And we normally have a, an idea of the sort of material, physical thing which is going to form the basis of our museum. If, if your exhibition is a contemporary art installation, this will vary slightly because the, the object or the room or the space itself is part of that, is part of the, ex is part of the experience in a way that the space in which you set up your temporary exhibition or museum is not. You know, you're trying to create an environment with a, with a contemporary art installation, whereas with a, a, a pop-up museum or heritage display, what you're trying to do is to get people to using the space to engage with a particular set of objects or historical information. Now, we often have an idea for something, and we want we have an idea about what it should look like, and we often begin with that and. We need to, and I, I heard that um, one of your speakers yesterday talked about uh, design. Uh, design is never, is never, can never carry an exhibition. The, the message, the story, the narratives of what you're trying to deliver need to be supported by the design and not the other way around. You don't tell a story about archaeology so that you can it sort of, you know, promulgate your vision for how archaeological displays in other people's places or windows or exhibitions should be displayed. You want to use the design to amplify a particular set of points or perspectives or narratives or elements around the objects or ephemera that you're putting on display. The idea of a museum or any sort of display like this always begins with a set of objects. Now, depending on the resources of your group and the resources of the spaces that you're working with, you may or may not have display cases available to you. If you don't have display cases available, despair not, the objects can still be included on a panel, but it's extremely important that your panel isn't sort of a very large print book. Um, because that is a, that it, that doesn't work in terms of display, it doesn't work in terms of design, and it won't work in terms of getting your message over. So when we talk about interpretation, and when we talk about design and interpretation, interpretation in a, in a museum context is really about stories, it's about narratives. Exhibitions tell stories, they get us to think about things, they tell us a they tell us ideas, they, they, we encounter ideas, we encounter objects, we encounter connections which, the, which an exhibition allows us to encounter. Somebody takes these objects, these five or six objects, they put them together and they try to get us to, to understand something deeper about the message uh, which, which these objects draw out. Now, any kind of exhibition um, will always be better if you can have multiple narratives because you don't have uh, and, and you don't have one person visiting your exhibition. You are not necessarily the audience for your exhibition or your pop-up display. There's a there's, there are sort of myriad people with myriad experiences and perspectives who will encounter or who you may wish to encounter what you've put together. And it's important to think about these all of these elements when you develop the interpretation and the narrative for your exhibition. So some of the key issues with interpretations are things like audiences. Um, who is meant to see these things? And I think it's important to be extremely realistic about who your audiences are. You're not necessarily going to get the archaeology department of every university in Ireland to come down to see your exhibition. Most likely, if it's in a, unless it's in a, a university department or uh, maybe even in a local history library. Think about the location and who is likely to encounter that exhibition. If the audience, if your intended audience or your target audience is different than the audience you will naturally get in the space provided, then you need to think about additional ways of attracting those people. But you can't, but it, it would be my, in my view, it would be very short-sighted and very silly to, uh, to neglect the audiences you will naturally have in that space. So that's, a, that's an important and key element. And also think about the people who use that space on a regular basis, who walk by it, 
what their perspective are, what their perspectives might be, and that sort of thing, and try to arrange elements of interpretation which will tick boxes for those people, for as many different types of audiences as you want. You're never going to get everybody. You're never going to be able to create an exhibition or a display or an interpretation which works or which gets the same messages across to every person. But you may be able to have a few elements which connect with different people. Accessibility is another extremely important part of any kind of exhibition, and accessibility in, in, in multiple ways. It's often, um, because I'm really short, I tend to hang things really low, because I don't like craning my neck to read something. But oftentimes, there will be bits of an exhibition or bits of a display which will be up high, and then children can't read them or can't see them because the kids are really low. Or, for example, somebody, if you, has anybody ever been to the Cliffs of Moher? Yeah. Has anybody ever been to the Cliffs of Moher with someone in a wheelchair? No. Uh, no? Anyone, yes? They can't see anything. Because the, um, the boundary wall around the cliffs is higher than the height that most people in wheelchairs can see. So when you pay your, however much it is, 10 euro or 12 euro, or whatever it is, to go to the cliffs, not only do you have to um, wheel yourself at extreme angles up to the side, once you get to the boundary wall, you can't see the cliffs at all. So it's important to think about these things when you're designing. There are people who are tall, there are people who are short. People will always complain about something though, um, and you can never mitigate that, but you can try to think about things from a particular perspective. If your display is on the inside of a shop window, is there a particular time of day, or is there a very large stretch of the day where there's a glare coming in from something and you can't read anything, and you can't see anything because of the, because of the glare in the window? Now, you may not be able to mitigate that sort of a thing, but you might try to find the place where that's worse and leave that out and leave a, a bit of space there for maybe some light to go into the room or try to avoid it. These sorts of logistical issues will play an enormous role in the way in which people perceive your exhibition or your display because they don't think about have they, when, when most people go to an exhibition, they don't think to themselves, oh, is there a narrative here that I can engage with on a really personal level and find compelling? They think, does it look nice? Anything interesting that I want to see? What is this, what, is there anything that attracts my attention? And then they'll delve deeper and deeper. And you want to provide layers for people to excavate. Layers of interpretation, layers of narrative. There are some people who will want to be very shallow very shallowly engaged with your exhibition. And so maybe they want to look at one picture. Maybe they want to look at nothing. Maybe some people are into dates. Maybe some people are into stories. People are into quotations. People are into photographs. People are into objects. So provide multiple entry points and, and, and means of entry for people. There may be people who don't read English and who, for, or for whom uh, reading is, is too difficult. And for those people, what do you provide them? Will there, are they an audience that you don't care if you, if you engage with? It may be the case, it may not be the case. Is there, uh, is there a way that you can tell a story visually without using words? The other thing that, that's important to think about is where people start and thinking about the flow. If you have a very small space that you're working in, um, and, you have a particular, uh, and you have a particular story or narrative to tell, where do people start? Can they start at the end? Can they start in the middle? Can they start at the beginning? And the, one of the challenges of this is you might not be there to tell them where to start. And so it can be, an, to, to avoid a confusing experience where people start somewhere and, and you don't know, you want to be able to give them hints. If they can't start anywhere, then your design is a place that can give them that hint. If they need to start at one point, then your design will help them identify where the beginning is. Uh, other things to consider, uh, sort of the area you have or the, zo the interpretative zones that you'll be dealing with. Most people, when who here has read a book? <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Most books are separated into chapters. Most chapters are separated into paragraphs. Most paragraphs are separated into sentences. Please do the same favor to the people visiting your exhibition. Think about the narrative, again, that you want to tell, and think about what the key elements of that story are and how you can break them down for your, for your visitor. 
Now, you're not going to be able to cram everything that you want to say onto a few panels. No matter how big or how small your exhibition is, less is always more. The, the experience that you want to give your, your visitor, the experience of the narrative that you want to tell, you're better off telling a few small stories with a lot of scope for people to get involved with them than to try to cram the entirety of an entire story into, into one single panel. And your zones or your areas, the physical layout of the space you're dealing with, will help you, um, will help you or either hinder you in doing that. But you need to use, and that's where again design comes in to help you navigate and negotiate those spaces to provide very logical, very digestible sections for your your visitor to to read. Um, additional questions, things like, will you have objects in your exhibition? What kind of lighting is there? These are all important things to consider as well. So this exhibition is one which is a, a temporary pop-up touring exhibition. It's about um, 25 feet long and about, 10, and about maybe 8 feet high. Um, so the person that you see over here, this guy is actually sort of life-size on the exhibition panel. Um, well, maybe it's a bit higher than that. This exhibition was meant to, uh, was part of a Peace 3 program in Northern Ireland addressing using the potato as a metaphor for Irish identity. Um, what could be more Irish than a, potato, than a potato? Well, apparently lots of things because potatoes don't come from Ireland. They're a new world, they're a new world food. So what we wanted to do with this exhibition was tie together multiple narratives. Now you obviously can't read any of this because it's too small, but what we have here are multiple narratives which allowed visitors to enter the, enter the story at any point. Because we knew the exhibition was going to be visited by many people at one time, maybe 50 people, we, wanted, we didn't want to have a, a queue at one end as you work your way to the other end. So what we did was put the introductory text to the exhibition, the main interpretation, at what would normally be the logical conclusion of the exhibition, the other side. And we used these green bullet points as potential entry points for people to, uh, to come into the exhibition. Now, the green story, the green, the, inside the green bullets are uh, sort of the story of the potatoes entry into Ireland. Uh, when potatoes were discovered in, in the new, sort of discovered in the new world, how they were brought back, how they were integrated into the diet first of the elite and then into uh, into the, sort of the everyday diet and that sort of thing. And we illustrated this with historical drawings, paintings, and artwork. Now, obviously, we don't have the paintings or artwork physically inserted into the picture, but we use them to illustrate these points. The red dots, the red sections, were stories from local people about their memories of potatoes um, and what they felt about their communities and how, what they felt about the nature of Irishness. Um, we then used additional little elements here and there. This green text um, over here is uh, the green text like there and there are little poems and stories uh, in, Latin, in both in Ulster, Scots, and in Irish um, about potatoes. Um, so what this exhibition did was it provided multiple narratives. They were layered narratives. If you were interested in the history of the potato, you could go with that. If you were interested in a little bit of literature or sort of, uh, sort of the, the other elements of culture related to it, we, you could go with that. If you were just interested in reading the word for potato in different languages, that was written across the top of the exhibition as well. And there were very simple ways of going around. And you didn't get lost no matter what entry point you went into. Now this is what design and good design can do for your exhibition. We went to the designers with this content and said, we want something which people will be able to enter and deal with at many different levels. If people want to read all of the text, we'd like to give them a, a consistent and logical narrative from each bullet point to the next. But we also want people to be able to just look at the pictures and get something from them. So the pictures themselves actually tell the story of how the potato got to Ireland. So this, was a, this is a way in which a pop-up temporary exhibition allowed, uh, dealt with both its space, because we had an enormous space to fill, it was very, very low, it was like a gymnasium, but also dealt with the types of audiences that we were dealing with, who weren't typically historically minded or very, or particularly interested in history, but had an interest in this thing that everyone could really relate to, the spud. 
So again, this is basically what we what we talked about. So we, we started the, the we started the exhibition with the question, what could be more Irish than the potato? Uh, and we allowed these different types of layered interpretations. And people really engaged with it because it allowed for people to have their own identities uh, reflected back to them. There were multiple stories, multiple ways of looking at it. There wasn't one thing that this exhibition told you. It was, you could, you could really draw your own experiences and people used it to reminisce and that sort of thing. Now, designing interpretation panels um, is, uh, there are lots of different types. Um, the types that we're going to talk about today um, include pop-up stands, what I call architectural configurations, which are the, the stand that you see, that you saw there, um, wall-mounted panels, either Fomex or MDF, um, or vinyl panels that you just stick right on the wall. This is a sort of back-of-the-envelope calculation of how much these different things cost. Um, there are benefits, there are upsides and downsides to each of them. Um, and one of the most important things to consider before you get your heart set on any of them is the nature of the space that you're dealing with and what your long-term plans are for the exhibition. If you have a touring exhibition or an exhibition that you'd like to put up and then take down and then put up again, things like uh, vinyl panels which can't be stored um, and which can be damaged extremely easily might not be the hot way to go. Uh, things like wall-mounted panels, Fomex and, and MDF, MDF in particular is very heavy, so you need to make sure that you have the right type of installation tools to put it up, but also MDF is hard to store because it takes up a lot of space. Pop-up stands don't look as polished as MDF does, but they're extremely easy to store, and the architectural configurations are, in my, my view, my favorite, but they're extremely expensive. Um, they have some benefits, though, which is that you can replace the skins on them and maintain the architecture bit. So it's the architecture bit that costs um, that costs a lot more than the skins do. But we'll go through all of this anyway. So this, is, this is X design, and, and with that, I'm assuming most of you aren't that exempt. Um, so uh, the other thing to note is that if your exhibition or project or something is tourism related. Now, I'm not the most um, astute on the legal elements of this and where the, and where the boundaries lie, um, partly because I've had the luxury of working for VAT exempt companies. Um, but uh, the VAT rate normally is 22% or 23.5% or whatever it is. If your product is a tourism product, it can be as low as 9%. Little aside. So pop-up stands. Um, we've all seen these. Um, they can be extremely handy. They're great to take around with you. They take about two minutes each to set up once you get quick at it. Um, you can take 15 of these panels in a car and set them up and take them down in, you know, in, in no time whatsoever. They can look really nice together um, as a group, but they are a bit flimsy. They, um, and, you know, and they are not as polished necessarily as something which is um, you know, which is hanging on the wall or has its own sort of structure. Um, this exhibition is from the Kinder Transport journey that uh, the Office of the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, created in 2009 to celebrate the, the Kinder Transport and toured around Northern Ireland. Um, so th these sorts of things are extremely handy. Um, so if you have a, an extremely easy to tour, so if your exhibition needs to be in a place, and let's say, for example, you're in a community hall, and the community hall, you're doing your exhibition, and then the next day, you have your yummy mummies group coming over to do yoga, and they, the exhibition needs to come down, this is a really straightforward thing to do. You take it down, they could even take it down, they stick it back up, everybody enjoys it, and nobody gets stressed out and has their yoga done. Um, so that's a that's one that's a consideration and an extremely important consideration um, in my view. The other nice thing about this is that your exhibition can be chopped up. Um, your you know if you get 15 panels done, but then all of a sudden you want to put it in a space that can really only accommodate 10 panels, you, you know you've got to cut five panels out, but you don't need to throw them out. Um, and you can you can it's flexible enough to deal with different types of spaces, and it's also gives you the discipline to break up your exhibition into these bite-sized chapters. So if you think of each panel as a chapter or a section in a set of three panels which create a chapter, then you can think more uh, in a much more structured way about how you want to tell your story. Um, these panels are extremely, uh, tend to be extremely text heavy. Um, and a good, and I don't know if somebody's talking about this or has or will, but a good rule of thumb is that you never want to have more than 
50 words, maybe, maybe 60 words. 60 is a lot. That's a text-heavy exhibition. 60 words to a panel is a lot of words. I'd better to have 30. Um, but once you start writing your exhibition text, you'll realize just how challenging that is. Um, but the best, th but in my view, usually the best way to do that is to write it all out and then chop and be ruthless. These are, this is an architectural configuration, very similar to the one, the potato exhibition. Um, this is part of a piece two program that was set up in Northern Ireland, and this um, is this sort of stand uh, an exhibition were set up in Newton Abbey Borough Council's um, council sort of lobby area. So when you walked into the building, this is what you got. Um, as you can see, there are uh, my briefcase there on the chair, um, but also a little coffee table, and people would be milling around. So it was a space that got a lot of use. Um, we knew that there was going to be a lot of people there. We had the space to put up this kind of an exhibition. And we, and again, we tried to provide multiple entry points, which allowed people to um, sort of digest bite-sized pieces of the exhibition. This exhibition is way too text heavy, um, in my view. Um, and, uh, and, it, and one of the challenges, it, it, as you will always find, is trying to balance the, the objects or the use of objects with the exhibitions. Now, in the case of this exhibition, we were able to take advantage of display cases that were in the council lobby, and so we were able to put objects which appeared in the exhibition in the cases. Now, all of the objects that you see here were actually loaned to us from members of the community, so none of them were owned by the museum service. These were all on loan. Um, and what we see here, and these are two of my favorite ones, is Arnold Schwarzenegger in the middle um, holding up two women. It, he, this was taken in Belfast, I think, in 1971, um, after he won one of the Mr. World competitions. And the other uh, is the same woman here and here, and that's George Best. Um, she was a reporter for the Belfast, uh, for some sort of little Belfast paper, and uh, managed to, you know, have these sort of experiences. And these were her photographs that she loaned us for the exhibition. But we can also see that they appear on the far left-hand side on the panels um, as well. So, if you, so you know, this is a way of drawing together the the original objects, the actual objects, with. The, with your exhibition panels. So you want it to be visually appealing, but you also, if you can, in my view, want to include objects which, uh, which will help to illustrate the story. And there's absolutely no harm in having an object on a panel which you also have in a case. It, it actually creates a really nice uh, bridge between the exhibition and the structure of the exhibition and, and, and actual objects from history. I'll say one other thing. One of the other benefits of having physical objects is that um, it, depending on what they are and depending on the cases you may or may not have available to you, um, if they don't have particular monetary value, then it can be easier to display them than if they have enormous monetary value. So, um, you know, these, uh, this little plate that you see there is from a, a Sunday school um, in Newton Abbey. Now, that doesn't have any monetary value. It has enormous uh, historical value because of the story that it tells and we and that story gets illustrated in the panels a little bit but it's also a way to to bring people in uh, and things like that so any as we talk about museums we always need to remember that museums are the core of museums are objects and the, and the, our purpose in putting an exhibition together is to highlight or to bridge I mean and this is certainly my perspective the to bridge the past and present by using objects uh, and the objects will tell a story, but sometimes the objects on their own can't tell a story, and that's what the interpretation and the design is there to do, to support the objects in telling their story. Wall-mounted panels. Um, this is a very large wall-mounted panel. It was, I believe, uh, 10 feet long, um, maybe more than that. It's 12 or 15 feet long and 8 feet high or something. It was enormous. Uh, printed on MDF. Um, and mounted using battens attached to the wall. Um, this was a, a, an exhibition about the Ranks Factory in, uh, in Limerick that we did at the Hunt Museum uh, with Limerick City Archives. And uh, we wanted to, again, um, layer interpretation and layer stories so that people could uh, enter the exhibition and go around. The primary audience for this was, of course, people who contributed to the exhibition through reminiscence sessions and oral histories, but also people who would use the, who would utilize these sorts of, of, of exhibitions and, and time to 
reconnect and to reminisce with, uh, with, their, with their friends and with their family. And what we can see here um, is a photograph of some of the people who visited the exhibition and we can see the, uh, it, the, the interpretation behind. So, what we, so when we put the exhibition together, we had multiple, we told multiple, we, we told multiple stories. The story, as you walked into the exhibition, you got the, the history of the factory, the process, that was one narrative. The second narrative was a day in the life of a worker. So when you walked into work, everybody used to walk in through the same entrance, and they would go to work, and then they would have their social life, and then they were there for home life, and that sort of thing. That was the second narrative. The third narrative took us through the process of milling flour. So we started with the, uh, the farming elements and brought it around to the final bit where ranks had their baking demonstrations. And the fourth narrative that we layered on was uh, was a diachronic look at the uh, was look at the history of the factory from its earliest days in the in the nineteen in the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries all the way through to its destruction and closure in the nineteen eighties. And so we layered these stories together. And so by going around the exhibition, if you were interested in the people's lives, then you could follow that story. If you were interested in flour, you could follow that story. If you were interested and sort of the heritage of this particular uh, venue in Limerick, then you could follow that story as well. And layering those set, those types of interpretations meant that we tried to engage with as with a broad as broad an audience as possible. Uh, so th this exhibition won um, the award in 2012 for best or 2011 I don't remember which for best um, interpretation by the Industrial Heritage Association of Ireland. And so we were obviously extremely pleased about that. But I think one of the reasons why it worked is because we integrated as me all of these layers and all of these stories. We can see in the red uh, box in the middle, that's a quotation taken from one of the Ranks factory workers through an oral history project, which was uh, a, a, a sort of a massive collaboration between Mary Immaculate College and Limerick City Archives um, and ourselves at the Hunt. And what that did was that it brought, it constantly reminded people when they were looking at these historical pictures that there were connections to the present. So it was about, again, building that bridge between past and present. That's obviously and very certainly one of my own styles of doing things and my own interpretative styles. And you will all have your own interpretative styles. And that perspective that you bring will make your exhibitions unique and excellent. Um, but it is important to recognize the limitations that your own view will have. Um, if, and, and it's important, therefore, to make sure that you include other people's perspectives or at least provide opportunities for people to lay their own stories down. And one of the ways that you can do that is by not overburdening your exhibition with text. Images, objects, uh, photographs, documents, these are things which inspire people to think. You look at a photograph and you think about Okay, so, you know, is this guy the boss and that's why he's winning? Is he just really good? There's the guy who's not wearing any shoes. Why isn't he wearing shoes? You know, we can see all of the, of the women and children lined up on the side, this sort of thing. We want to engage with these people. We have an idea about what their personalities are like. We connect with them. But for some people, it will be, the connection will be, you know, the, uh, the, the photograph of the wedding um, or the photograph above or the mass, that sort of thing. So you want to provide these opportunities without being too heavy-handed about the message that you want to, to lay down to people. And also remembering that you're never, ever going to be able to tell the entire story. Final panels. Um, the panel on the, now the poster is actually a, a real poster, uh, but the panel on the, uh, on the, to the right of it uh, is a vinyl panel which is attached to the wall. It was part of a People's Choice exhibition that was done at the Brain and Ballerina in 2010, uh, 2009 or 2010, where people, members of the public, were invited to come into the, the museum storeroom and pick out their favorite object. The object was then displayed as part of an exhibition, um, and you can see it's, it's being hung up using mirror clips. Um, mirror clips are these things, are these screws that go into the back of frames that um, lie flat against the wall, and they mean people can't nick your painting, um, at least without a drill or a screwdriver. Uh, so people came in, they picked their favorite object, and what we did was create a a panel that had the picture of the object, the picture of the person who picked it out, a quotation from them about why they liked their object, and then uh, historical information about the object. It was very interpretation light. Um, 
we didn't, it, the museum was very much, it was very important not to dictate the nature of the interpretation or the nature of, of any particular story. When you go into a museum, oftentimes you expect or receive uh, a sort of authoritative narrative. This is what you need to know about this painting. <laughs> this is what we think goes next to that. You have a Henry Moore drawing, you put it next to the other Henry Moore drawing. You have myolica jars, you put them with the other myolica jars, or maybe not. It, it's all dependent. That, that story, that permanence which museums have is part, of their, is part of their narrative. An exhibition like this is meant to, again, disrupt that, to make a much more friendly, much more user-friendly, and much more sort of democratic approach to the collection. Because the thing which ties all of these objects together is that somebody in the area likes them. Liam Neeson's daughter picked out, uh, not daughter, uh, sister picked out uh, a, stat a nun doll that we had in the collection, for example. The nun doll has nothing to do with the Rolling Stones poster, has nothing to do with the fire engine here, and has nothing to do with the drum and Union Jack in the background. Only in as much as someone in the area thought, kind of fancied those objects. And that's what brings the exhibition together. And so the quotations from, uh, from each person describing why they liked the object or why they hated the object, Leah Beeson's sister hated the nut doll, uh, for example, uh, is, is part of what was enjoyable. And so it's important to think about what brings your exhibition together. What's the overriding narrative? What's the underlying idea which gives integrity to everything else which comes from it? I'm a very firm believer that if the original nugget has integrity, then everything that comes out of it will have some sort of connection to that. Even if, you know, for example, in the Ranks exhibition, we didn't, ha we didn't beat people over the head with these are the four narratives which you will encounter in the following exhibition. One of them is a history of flower. People would have been out the door. You know, it's important to understand what those narratives are, but allow people to discover them. And if they don't work for them, then they won't find out. You know, and that's fine because it's about because the exhibition isn't about you. It isn't really even about the objects. It's really about what you what the objects can give to other people and what the narratives interpretations can give to other people. So vinyl panels. Um, when you take them off the wall, sometimes you can keep them, sometimes you can't. So designing interpretation panels. Um, now, working with graphic designers and suppliers, there are three elements to think about, at least, um, but these are the three that if you think about nothing else, you probably won't um, do anything too awful. Um, to tender or not to tender. Now, public procurement levels in ROI are 5,000 euro. So, which means that anything under 5,000 euro, you don't have to get quotes for, and you don't have to go to tender for. Most of you will be working on budgets, I imagine, significantly smaller than 5,000 euro. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably, what, like 1,000, maybe 800, something yeah. like that? Uh, tendering is not necessarily an expense, is not, doesn't have to be an expensive process, but it, if it's done right, it's extremely time consuming. It will, in my view, however, always land you with some of the best results because any kind of open competition will mean that providers compete with each other, they know that they're competing with each other for your business and that sort of thing. Now, if your budget's extremely small, it's very unlikely that you're going to get people interested in spending time to put together a tender to submit for 500 quid or, or whatever it is. Um, so you'll need to go for quotes and I recommend that as well. If your cousin is part of a design firm, if your nephew, if your nephew's girlfriend works for a printer, that's very nice for all of them. Um, it's very important that you actually go out there and, and retrieve quotes. And the way to get quotes is to be extremely specific about what you want, not the nature of the design. You know, don't tell them necessarily what color scheme you want or what kind of font you want. That doesn't matter. That's their job. But thinking about, I want pop-up stands. I want 15 pop-up stands that are double-sided. You can get those things so you can see them from, so they've got design on either side. I want double-sided pop-up stands. I want them to be this height. I want them to be this width. I want this many of them. How much is it to have them delivered? Don't forget about delivery charges because that costs extra. Um, how long will it take to print them? What's your print, you know, what's your, um, what if I want an extra one? What if one gets damaged? 
how many days of revision do I get, um, and that sort of thing. You need when you when you write any sort of text and put any text on an exhibition panel, whatever however long you think it's going to take you to edit that text and to modify it to find mistakes in it, you need to multiply that by like three or four. Okay, it always takes a lot longer than you think. And printing never takes less than two weeks. Never. Because there's always a problem. If there isn't a problem, then lo and behold, you get your exhibition sooner than intended. So you better have a place to store it um, in, in, until it's ready to go up. But the last thing you want is to have uh, sort of invitations or posters circulating, promoting your exhibition, and then you're waiting for the printer to deliver it on the day. I don't wish that experience on anyone, um, having lived through it myself. DIY design. So designers will often take your text, take your images, and stick something together. If you don't like it, you can tell them. If you're not happy with it because they didn't listen to what you said, then they need to fix it. If it's not to your taste, but it's, but it's the designer that you went with, sometimes it's worth living with because you're probably not a designer. If you are a designer, then you can do the design yourself. If you're not a designer, please do not attempt to do the design yourself. It will end up like, like, like a web page from the 1990s, um, and no one will, will do you any favors. Design is a craft. It is something which is learned. It's not a hobby. None of this is a hobby. You know, museum professionals, we train for years and years and years and put lots of time and experience into doing this full time. Do not expect yourselves to be able to produce the same type of exhibition or the same the same caliber or design of exhibition as somebody who does it professionally. If you tinker with your car, you're going to have the same result that if you tinker with, your exhi with an exhibition. Um, which isn't meant to dissuade you, but ask for help. There's no, there's no harm. There are loads of little museums out there, people who are looking for experience. You know, think about who's around, who you might be able to ask. You should show your design or your exhibition or your idea to loads of people and see what they have to say about it. Um, and as you bring these things together, remember that. So DIY design is to be avoided unless you have no money, in which case, go for it. Um, <laughs> the uh, two, uh, sort of two or three suggestions I'll give you, if you have photographs um, uh, that you want to put on your, on your exhibition panel, having a photograph taken of the photograph will nine times out of 10 yield a better image for your exhibition panel than scanning it will. Um, a specimen photographer is also worth their weight in gold. They will take much better pictures. Have any of you ever tried to Instagram your food? I don't know how people take pictures of food. It's impossible, as far as I can tell. It's the same thing with taking a really great picture of an object, especially an object which is kind of boring otherwise. Um, if you have a doubloon rescued from you know, a, a, a wrecked Spanish ship, you could take a picture of it with your phone, I'm sure it'll be great and everyone will love it. Unless it's that interesting, my suggestion is to try to find somebody who knows what they're doing to take a picture. Um, photographers usually cost around 200 to 250 euro a day, but if you have your, your, all of your eggs in a row, um, or ducks in a row, I always get that mixed up. Um, <laughs> You can put your all of the objects together or bring them together to have them photographed. So if you have a community session where people are bringing along their objects and documents and things like that, make sure you have a photographer on hand to take pictures. It takes about 10 minutes at a minimum, probably more like 10 to 15 minutes per object for the photographer to get the picture that you're looking for. Uh, so if you have 100 objects, it's not going to be done in a day. You need to give it proper time. Also, there's no way you're going to put 100 pictures in your exhibition um, unless it's a really, really massive space. Um, so that's, that's sort of that. Designers will often employ printers. So if you work with a designer, you should expect them to engage with the printer and arrange for the stuff to be printed and delivered to you. That's part of what you're paying them for. Um, if you are doing the design yourself, then you need to be very specific with your printer about the type of file that they're supposed to get. Is it a TIFF file? Is it a PDF? Is it a, a Photoshop file? Um, I worked with somebody who used CorelDRAW. I'd never worked with a designer uh, or a printer who used CorelDRAW before, but apparently they exist. It's important to identify very early on what their expectations are and what your expectations are so that you can communicate with them effectively. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that you've paid for or that you have to pay for that you don't want. Now, you may end up with that anyway, but you can at least try to mitigate it. 
now the fun bit, installing and deinstalling. I'm going to start at the bottom of the slide. Deinstallation is not free. Um, it's not free either in time or in money. When you take something off the wall, especially if it's wall mounted, you don't necessarily know what you're going to find underneath it. You may pull a panel off a wall, or you may have battens for MDF, or you may even stick up Fomex with double-sided Velcro or whatever, and then take a chunk of plaster off the wall uh, when you remove the thing. This is, those are some of the downsides of using uh, wall mounted wall mounted displays because they, they touch the wall. A pop-up stand or those architectural things, they don't touch anything. And so when you take them down, there's no cleanup. Um, that's one of the enormous benefits of them. Uh, but installing, uh, one question you need to ask, do you need to paint? What do the walls look like? If they look like garbage, then your exhibition's gonna be brought down by them. Filthy walls with stains, marks, and you may look at a room and say, oh yeah, it looks great, it looks great. Go in there and photograph and make a list of every single thing which needs to be done in order to bring that space up to a spec which is acceptable. So especially when you're dealing with empty shop front, with empty shops, this can mean that there are nails hanging around on the floor, that there's bits of skirting board which have nails sticking out of it. All of those are hazards for your visitors. And, and while it's very unlikely that somebody's gonna walk into a nail and get tetanus, you never know. Um, and if you don't look, then chances are uh, they will. Things like wall-mounted displays, who puts them up? Uh, they, are, they can be extremely unforgiving. Vinyl panels in particular, which go straight onto the wall, you have to be absolutely sure that those things are level, otherwise that's it. You go to take it off the wall to, re to adjust it, you tear it, you need another one. That's another 100 euro down the drain. Um, it's important to think about all of those things as well. Um, make the, for vinyl panels, the quality of the wall is extremely important. If it's pocked in any way, if it has any sort of texture, it's not going to work, it's not going to look right. Who puts them up? Chances are it's you. Um, do you have experience drilling things into the wall? Do you know if it's a cavity wall or another kind of wall? If there are battens, do you need to use plugs? You know, how do you do it? All of these things are extremely important, um, and the painting as well. Deinstallation, again, is not free. It takes longer than you think it will, especially if you want to conserve the exhibition to put it up someplace else five years from now or five days from now. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and if your designers or your printers are installing the exhibition, you need to negotiate with them a price for, de for taking it down as well, because that is not going to be included. Um, con uh, you could do a whole section on contracts and, uh, and how you sign a contract with the designer and things like that, but, um, it's, but that's sort of beyond the scope of, of what, I, what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, but read it all. <laughs> So the vinyl displays, the benefits, they're cheaper than panels or pop-ups for a multi-panel exhibition. You can get big ones, you have a lot of control over the design. Um, in some ways, you know, they're not heavy, so you don't have to worry about how structurally sound or not the wall that you're dealing with is, things like that. Drawbacks are only single use. Um, you need a really, really good even wall surface. Uh, and the installation requires a lot of exact placement. There's a zero forgiveness factor. If you're using battens, for example, to install a, an MDF panel or a Fomex panel, you can usually kind of adjust a little bit. Once the vinyl's on the wall, that's it, you're done. Um, and so, you know, a good, a, a few <coughs> levels and things like that are extremely important. This is what I call the triangle of truth. It designs, it applies to everything. Um, you can have two legs, but not all three. So if you want it good and fast, it's not going to be cheap. If you want it good and cheap, it's not going to be fast. And if you want it fast and cheap, it's definitely not going to be good. <laughs> so think so you can apply that to every stage and every level of any kind of exhibition or project um, that you do. Uh, the like I say, design, life, <coughs> etc. Objects. Objects are extremely important if you can get if you can manage them. These are. Um, I forgot what they're called. Um, these are, are palms, that's what they're called, they're palms, that uh, you, people, men used on ships when they were uh, using uh, marlin spikes to uh, work on the sails and, and, uh, and braid rope. Uh, and they would, you stuck your thumb through the little hole and it would save your palm. It was like a thimble for your palm, sort of, as you, as you did all of this. They have absolutely no monetary value. They're extremely interesting, and they look great. The other thing that you'll see here are these little plastic numbers. Um, 
it, somebody will talk to you or has talked to you about labels and captions. Oh, if you can label an object, label it. If you can create, in, in my perspective, if you can create a booklet that has extended captions, you know, sometimes people just want to know what something's called. Sometimes they want to know the history of it, what his mother, th what his mother thought about this, and 5,000 quotes and its first uh, recorded use in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> Somewhere between the two of them is what you want for your extended captions, if you choose to do them. Um, extended captions take an enormously long time to put together, but they can be extremely rewarding. And they can help provide additional layers of interpretation for, uh, and provide space for all of that wonderful research and text that you wrote, which you can't put onto your exhibition panels because you're only allowed 35 words. Um, the other thing about that is uh, I, I do, that I do recommend is creating large font uh, pad, captions for things because not everybody can read um, small fonts and not everybody um, can manage particular text, especially on exhibition panels. Now, w just going back briefly to accessibility, one of the things that's important is that white text on a dark background is more difficult to read than black dark text on a white background. Um, there are some accessibility rules like that about uh, that will uh, make a difference to your exhibition. A very cheap way to get around that is to have the text printed out in large font on some A4 paper that you then laminate and you know bind together with a with a keychain, and then you have very accessible text for people who can't really manage the text on the exhibition panel itself. That's a very, very cheap, very easy way, and it really elevates the, the sense that your exhibition is open and available to people. Um, and people tend not to steal those things. Um, and if they do, they've only just got a keychain. So I, I do recommend not putting a nice keychain. <laughs> so audio-visual installations. Why have them? Um, they are, again, if you have stories, oral histories, if you have video, those sorts of things, it can really enhance and add a human element to your exhibition. People don't like exhibitions about stuff. They like exhibitions about people, but they want to see stuff in them. Um, the drawbacks, good AVs cost money. To hire a, if you want to do, you know, again, if you want to get a, a professional videographer, usually somebody who does wedding videos, um, to videotape somebody telling a story and then cut it into a film, that usually costs between, I would say, six to 600 to 1,000 euro per minute of edited footage. That includes the filming, the editing, and cutting you the DVD. That's very expensive. It's still, if you want to do that, it's worth it. A crappy video, excuse my language, is not going to do you any favors. Um, it's better not to have a video than to have a video which where people are just sitting there saying, um, uh, um, uh, that sort of thing. If you want that sort of thing, you can also just stick it on YouTube and invite people, put a QR code up or some sort of web address up and invite people to visit that video uh, when, they, when they have an internet connection. Um, other things around videos, does the DVD that you've created, does it loop properly? Does the video, does the DVD player that you're using have a looping option um, if, the, if the DVD doesn't loop? Who sets it up and turns it off every day? <laughs> That's a big, big issue. Um, it doesn't need to, can it run all night? If there's an audio component, where is the space that this, that this thing is playing in? And, uh, and are they going to, are the people in the cafe who are working there next to this video going to throw a shoe through it after you know, four hours of listening to the same story and being able to recite it in their sleep? Uh, you know, things like that are extremely important. Whose equipment is it? Do you borrow the equipment? Is it your DVD player? If somebody knocks it off the stand, are you going to get upset? Um, and then who troubleshoots because there's always troubleshooting stuff involved. Uh, and not to mention the fact that you need to put it on the television. Oops, wrong direction. So uh, for this one, we had a new Navi. Uh, we did have a video component. We made a, a little box and stuck a TV and a DVD player in there, and we drilled some holes in the uh, in the box to allow for the sound to come out properly. But it also acted as a damper for some of the um, low grade noise that comes that always comes out out of out of speakers. Um, the receptionist in the council offices did not thank us, um, but they but we didn't get a stiletto through the screen either. So <laughs> we're going to call that a win. 
Use of projections. Well, there are loads of uses. The benefits is that it's immersive. You can get life size. You can go beyond what a screen can deliver. You can get life size moving people if you use a big projection. The drawbacks, money. Good projectors cost a lot of money. Again, who turns it on and off every day? Who troubleshoots? Um, lamps only last a certain number of hours in projectors. So if your lamp goes, uh, you know you need to, and you don't necessarily know how many hours are left in your lamp. Um, whose equipment, and then with projections, remember that audio is not a given. Additional equipment is needed in order to have audio. So the last thing you want is you spend all this money or time borrowing this projector from your cousin, and you got this great video of people doing stuff, singing historical songs, all of it, and all of a sudden, all you realize is that people are standing there and their mouths are moving and you can't hear anything. Um, that is, again, a situation to be um, avoided. And, but that also means that you end up with more wires. And more wires includes, it, it means that there's more possibility of something going wrong, um, including people tripping on things. Some cheap and fun ways to add objects to your, to your displays are maybe to, you know, sometimes people have, will be, have these potato sacks. This is one that was loaned to us um, it's not a potato sack, it's a flowers bag from Ranks. And then we have the, the other ones printed up by the design company, by the printing company that we use to print up the panels. Now those are, again, very cheap, very easy. They were full of um, bits of foam, so they didn't cost anything to, to create, really. But they just enhanced the entire feel of the exhibition. Um, and again, we can see people here with the, with the images in the background, and you can see the, the sense of it, there's a feeling of engagement, and that was one of the, the things which we thought was extremely successful. And you can also see the size of the font behind the guy in the middle's head. This is another uh, temporary pop-up exhibition, which was in a permanent space, and uh, this is another one from Northern Ireland. We can see that it's crammed full of objects, and it has much less text. One of the um, ways in which this exhibition operated is that the themes of each section, remember we talked about the interpretative zones, were highlighted and basically given to you at the title, on the title board at the top of each panel. So if you wanted to, you could just read the top of the, uh, the, top of the, the thing. The exhibition was called um, Images of Ireland, the Politics of Identity, 1875 to 1916. Um, and it explored the way in which Ireland and Irishness and Irish identity was constructed, performed, perceived, uh, and, and perceived in, in other parts of the world. And we had, the, we had sort of three or four different zones, um, interpretative zones, which had objects related to this. So the panel that you can see here is one that says revealing identity. And then you can see there's a bit of introductory text around that. And then the objects then lead and tell the story and are explained a bit in text. Again, this is another very text-heavy exhibition. Um, but again, one of the challenges of any exhibition is uh, sort of diminishing the desire within you to cram it full of as much text as you can manage. Um, objects again played an extremely important part, and, and were used to tell the story. And it was, and in this case, we had uh, we had the exhibition, in, and we we had available to us cases, and so we were able to use cases to display some of the objects, which were then which then appeared on the exhibition panels. This was a touring exhibition, and as a, and, and because of the nature of the exhibition, we weren't able, and the spaces we wanted to tour it to, we weren't actually able to send the objects around with the exhibition. So it's again really important that the objects that that could be could appear on the panels did appear and appeared in a way which helped to explain the story. Um, before we go any further, I'll mention a couple of other things. If you find an image on the internet or in a museum or a book or something like that or the Mary Evans Picture Library that you'd like to use in your exhibition, you need to get the proper copyright permissions to, rep to, to reproduce it. In some cases, in many cases even, that might not cost you anything. Um, however, it might. Um, and it'll certainly cost you less than a lawsuit. So the way in which you go about these things is looking at, look for uh, image archives. So you might go to your local city archive, local study <coughs> section of your library. The Mary Evans Picture Library is brilliant for um, historical images from literature and books and things like that. Really wonderful. And they're, they tend to be extremely reasonable in terms of both their price and their desire to um, support educational use of their uh, of the exhibit of, of things like <coughs> images for exhibitions. Is copyright still needed for 
uh, image is over 100 years old? Or yes. It is? Because it, it will, it may or may not be. The image itself may be owned. For example, um, there, there are photographs in, in this in this Images of Ireland exhibition which are owned, uh, which are in the collection of the uh, National, uh, National Museum of Northern Ireland. Um, at that, and some of those images were over 100 years old. We still needed those, they own those images and therefore they own the right to reproduce the image. And so you can describe the image in words if you like, you can even draw a picture of it. Um, but if you want to use that image, the, the reproduction rights of that image will be owned most likely by someone. Um, and so you will need to get their permission. If you, if you <coughs> gather photographs from people who live in the area, from community, from individuals, you will need, when you take a picture of that photograph, to request and to have them sign over the right to you to reproduce <coughs> that photograph. Usually, I suggest, now there are, there are exam templates for that sort of thing on the internet. If you Google it, you'll definitely find uh, a sort of permission slip that you're looking for, or your local museums or libraries or archives will most likely be able to help you in putting something together. My suggestion is to limit the use for, the use of your, your to limit the way in which you will use it. So in that permission slip, you might say, I, so-and-so, allow the um, Clonmel History Society to use, the f to use this image uh, for an exhibition on this topic, uh, you know, for, for this exhibition, um, and, and sort of limit it to that, not sort of use this picture in perpetuity for any purpose they deem fit and things that I don't particularly know about, but I'm unlikely to find out about as well. So that sort of thing, it just always keeps you in the right. The ethical, there, there are enormous ethical implications of working with, with individuals in the community, and, they, and people have every right to own the images that they own, the photographs, their family history, all of that is theirs. And if you'd like to use it, please be courteous um, and, and show people the respect for their heritage and their history um, in, as much as, you know, in as much as you can. And generally speaking, people will be more than delighted to assist you um, and not require any sort of enormous or egregious fee um, to show a picture of their long dead great great grandfather. Um, but it's always nice to ask. Does that help? Again, you can see uh, the way objects are used here um, and, and the way in which the, the, air, the, the exhibition space was marked out in zones. So we had, you know, we've got one zone off to the left with some sort of explicating object collection, another zone on the right, followed by another set of objects, that sort of thing. So thank you all, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your time. Thanks.